Welcome to the Good Life Coach Podcast. I am your host, Michelle Lamoureux. The intention of this show is to awaken you to your fullest potential. Join me each week for inspiring interviews to elevate an area of your life, as well as interviews with women entrepreneurs who are creating success on their own terms. Each episode provides actionable tips to guide you to design a life you love. Hey there, it's Michelle and welcome back to the show. Joining us today is Kathy Vines, who's been on the show a couple of times. She is a certified professional organizer and productivity specialist and the owner of Clever Girl Organizing. Now, the two other times Kathy came on, it was to help us get organized within our homes. But today we're talking about something really important that I think we often overlook, and that's how to be prepared in case of an emergency. And so Um, Just to note, Kathy is also the author of the book, Clever Girl's Guide to Living with Less, Break Free from Your Stuff, Even When Your Head and Heart Get in the Way. And I'm so happy you're back today, Kathy. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me back. I love your show and always love the opportunity to get to talk to you. Well, I love connecting with you as well. So thank you for being here. Um, We were talking before we started recording that, you know, obviously there's different kinds of emergencies. We're not going to get into detail about each one, but I was thinking about it before having you on. I was like, wow, depending on where you live, there's different scenarios. So I'm on the West Coast now. So that's fires and earthquakes potentially, Um, you know, on the East Coast when I lived in Boston, it's horrible weather and, uh, you know, ice storms, blizzards, ice storms, absolutely. right. Roofs could cave in that kinds of things. Yeah. Um, obviously we've seen the horrible flooding that's happened in, you know, various regions, or you maybe live in a situation where there's you know, the hurricanes and the tornadoes that are, you know, come through, there's just various scenarios. Um, but you're going to help us cover really the basics of what to have on hand. And I know you were explaining to me that you kind of have a three-part framework that we can dive into today. Great. Um, Do you want me to start with the framework so that people can kind of get grounded with how I think about it? I think that's helpful. Yes. Okay. So I tend to talk with people about emergency prep as kind of there are three different scenarios we might come across. One is where we're at home. Maybe it's a shelter in place situation, but we're at home and we're going to have limited access to supplies and services, right? So we need to figure out how to do more with being cut off from some things. The other is fleeing. So we got to scoot and, but not forever, right? For the time being, maybe it's a hurricane's coming to town and we want to get out of town for the week and we're going to come back. And then the third is fleeing. And it might be for good, right? The wildfires are, fires are coming or our house is on fire. There's no wildfire around, but it's just happening really locally. Um, there's some sort of sudden and really traumatic and drastic impact that might be permanent to where we're at. And so when I think of these three different kinds of emergency scenarios, I think about supplies and preparedness really differently. And so I'd love to kind of go through even from just the, what are the basics I always hope people are thinking of Yeah. to, I don't want you, I don't want people to live in a state of panic. So how do you get to a point where emergency preparedness is kind of a state of mind and you feel good about where you are knowing that you can't plan for everything? Yeah. And you know what to get and where to find it in case you need it. And it's interesting that the first one you talked about was this shelter in place. Cause you know, we all experienced our well, I think at least for most of us, our first and only lockdown experience just, you know, back when the pandemic started and we all were told, you know, head to the market, stock up for a month or so. And it was really shocking to go and see uh, empty shelves, you know, toilet paper, paper towels, beans, a lot of the basics that we take for granted that are just going to be there. So Yeah. um, yeah, can you speak more to this? Yeah, and I think you're right. I think, and for a lot of people who thought of themselves as prepared for emergency, kind of got a little bit of a trial run during these lockdowns. And, you know, and I'm in Boston where we had them for quite a while as well. And I think a couple of things we learn and people experience. Like, first of all, the first thing that everybody went out to get, even before there were lockdown discussions, was toilet paper, as if somehow this was some sort of a real risk with. 
uh, with with COVID or a pandemic or something, but it really spoke to the basics of people's feeling sense of security, like, oh my gosh, what would we do without toilet paper, right? They started thinking through, what don't I want to be left without? Right. And, and I saw, it brought out the worst in people. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but oh, then yeah. people started hoarding everything versus yes. thinking like, what do I really need? And then it was, I don't know, it brought out some sort of primitive response, I would say. Yeah. I absolutely, I absolutely agree. And I think that that's a little bit at the core of where I mentioned before that sense of feeling prepared. Yeah. If you know, and have this sense that, you know what, my family is prepared. And again, I'm not talking about somebody who's ready for the grid to collapse. I'm talking about somebody who says, you know what, if, if for some reason we couldn't leave our house for two to four weeks, we'd be okay. And so right. that is defining what okay would feel like and look like. What are the luxuries we would do without? What are the basics we absolutely need? Right. I, I think meat shortages really surprised people. Yeah. Um, that, you know, people started thinking like, well, what do you mean I'm not going to have meat in my freezer? What do you mean I can't get chicken? People started imagining, oh, if I'm going to have to be at home for four weeks, I have to do a lot more cooking than maybe I normally do. What does that even look like? So it's it really changed how we started shopping and thinking about things and then faced the shortages and the concerns. So That's right. it was a combination of a change of behavior and a supply system and a supply chain that wasn't really prepared for all of that at once. Right. So when I think about the shelter in place that we all went through, again, it's kind of a, a great test run for people to say, what what concerned us? What did we have access to after all that we didn't know was going to be there for us? And then actually, what was a problem? I always want people thinking of, again, what is that core list of things you need? We need, you know, imagine that you might need water, you yes. might need food. I always want people to be thinking about medications, mm. right? So many people in our country rely on a daily med a prescription-based daily wow. med, something they're only getting on a 30-day prescription and you're like, oh, I'm on day 28. I can't even get mine for two days. What do you mean I can't leave, right? And thinking about what are some of those critical things you need to have on hand to feel prepared, feel prepared and be prepared. I think that we've all gone through this little exercise that has helped us reframe. And it wouldn't surprise me if when people started hearing in the last couple of months, oh, lots of things are out on container ships, hmm, Toilet paper is going again. People went out and said, oh, that's right. I forgot. I need a toilet paper. I'm getting the 30 pack, not the 12 pack. Right. People thinking a little bit more about how to be safe. What if six months from now, things kind of slip again? Yes. Yes, for sure. Okay. But you talked about water, yeah. food, medications. What else would we add to that list? Uh, stuff for your menstrual cycle? I'm just thinking... Yeah, personal hygiene, personal, hygiene I think yeah. is 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 an important kind of basic to have in there. And again, it might not be the fancy toothpaste, it's having toothpaste, right? And and thinking about, all right, what are the basics that we need? If you've got pets, if you've got children, if you've got older folks that you're looking after, this actually changed things a little bit. Like what are the personal hygiene questions for those folks? What are the medication um, concerns you might have for them? Pet food, you know, are you on a special pet food for your pet? Do your pet need medication? So thinking about some of these things, mm. and again, those questions cut across all those three scenarios. Yes. Staying at home, fleeing for a little bit, fleeing for good. Right. Thinking about what are what are our real critical um, supplies that we need to have. Now, Kathy, I saw an Instagram story that you did where you were showing you were in your garage and showing us your shelving with all the yeah. stuff and how you have it all neatly packed. For a shelter in place, in a way, it's easy. You're not fleeing your house. You can have a dedicated area where you have your extra water, your extra toilet paper. You know, the um, medications obviously have a dedicated place, as do your personal hygiene you know, uh, supplies, but tell me if we're ready to go to the second one on fleeing your home. Um, and if we are, how do you have it? What do you put stuff in so that you can literally grab and go because you don't have an extra hour usually, right? If you're fleeing your home, you're, you're, you gotta go. So you exactly. need to make sure everything's yeah. ready to go with you. Though sometimes it isn't, it isn't immediate, right? Like if your house is on fire, we are in a grab and go situation and you yes. might not be grabbing all that much, yes. but you know, 
you know what? A hurricane's coming in three days. Yes. We need to evacuate. Yes. Um, we're watching the track. Well, now we have a little bit more time. And this is where being prepared and having things in the same location really helps, right? Okay. So for me, what we have is we have just, we've got these shelving, the metal shelving, durable metal shelving. I've got really organized bins for first aid, medication, food, water. We have a cooking, a camp stove, right? It's great to have great to have water and food, but if you need to cook it, how are you doing that? Different things. And then we keep right next to that our very durable, but no longer our primary kind of camping backpacks, Thule bags, durable duffel bags. Would you call it a Thule? Thule, T-H-U-L-E. It's a brand. You know, they make... uh, they make the car cover the car uh, yes. lids that go with I don't cover, camp, right? really durable so that, rugged. I, I might be at a disadvantage. Um, <laughs> maybe the idea of a really rugged, supplies. some rugged bags, right? And yes. what I mean by rugged, um, you know, the 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 handles are really going to stay on. They're probably waterproof or at least a very resistant fabric, um, and they're going to have a fair amount of room that you can put lots of things in that aren't necessarily specific shapes. So it's not really nice little pockets that suddenly you're like, oh, this camping stove doesn't fit in there. So we've got some big, they're like, you know, really durable, weatherproof duffels. I would say that. One of the really important things to remember is you can put lots of things in a bag, but if you can't lift it and carry it, forget about it. It's not a tool. So I think about for our house, we have we have kind of camping uh, backpacks and I actually have them some things are in there all the time, right? So honestly, when I go through clothing a couple of times a year and I say, all right, I don't really need these pants anymore. I don't really wear this sweatshirt anymore. I don't really wear these sneakers anymore. I'll put them in my grab and go kit because you're going to leave and you might need fresh clothes or warm clothes or dry clothes. And so thinking about having that. So I always keep those in a backpack. Um, w- which is right by our supplies. And again, we get to say, oh, first aid, that's a small container. I can put it in. Right. Oh, food, I have them broken out in three-day kits or seven-day kits. I can grab one or the other based on how long I think I'm going to be away. So I get to shop, but I've already done some pre-thinking around the shopping that's inside my supplies. And my supplies, I don't want anybody to get the impression I have a basement full, you know, racks and racks and racks. This is they kind of fit on one shelf. Right, one shelf. I made shelves, it, I probably you know, made it sound yeah, yeah. like it was your entire <laughs> garage. <laughs> it's, it's definitely <laughs> not, but like, it's like one big shelf, but it's organized. And then the second shelf are those bags and, you know, the tent and things we might use for camping. So you don't need to go all out and take over a whole house to have some prepared kits, and, kits at home. Okay, I love this. Um, what kind of, when you say a camping stove, it runs on yeah. gas? Little, little, little butane, little... Yeah. Kind of like the things that you would put on a chafing dish if you were yeah. at a party, right? Those little cans. So, of course, you also need to have matches involved, right? So, some things around what would it be if I needed to cook? I need a pot that I can boil water in. I need the camp stove. I need a fuel source. I need an igniter. Yeah. This is going to maybe come sounds... in lots of different places. Oh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, <laughs> do you always have your tank of your car on full as much as you can. Like if it goes below half, are you always like, I got to make sure it's a full tank. So I'm a, I'm a third. I'm not a half. My husband's okay. probably closer to a half, but I think being prepared in your car is its own chapter, right? From having emergency supplies inside your car to how you're thinking about the maintenance on the car to is your car full of gas. And that's another thing that we've seen. If you're in an area where people are evacuating and they say, oh, I have to drive 800 miles to get out of Florida. All right, let me go fill up with gas. And people can't get gas. Right, right? of course. So it's one of those little triggers. If I know a storm's coming, I know an ice storm's coming, I know something's happening. I'm typically going out and making sure our cars are full. In the same way, I know a, a nor'easter's coming and we might lose power. I'm charging my phone and my laptop just in case. Oh, right? I like that. Yeah. yeah that's a, and, you know, and you can always often charge some devices inside your car, right? But if you're conserving gas, right, you're not driving around <laughs> charging things. So thinking about, get back to, gets back to what are those critical things you want? For a lot of people, we want our phone charged. We want our laptop charged. Yes. Just for, I mean, it's not that we're going to binge Netflix if we don't think we're having power for a week. But we want to be able to have communication. We want to yeah. be able to access our, our electricity company and, and submit uh, submit a report that we have an outage. We want to watch what's happening with the outage. We need access and communication. Yeah, it's funny because when I booked you out of the blue that night, 
we lost power. Uh, and I might, if I had gone to bed before 10 o'clock, I might not have known, but it was 10, a, 10 PM. And I uh, opened the fridge and everything, you know, the lights all went da- dark, the whole, everything went out. And I was like, oh shit, we just lost our power. I think it came on in the middle of the night again. So we didn't have to get rid of food and anything, anything like that. But I was like, gosh, it could just happen suddenly. And then what, you know, if you're, if you're in your home situation, even if it isn't a lockdown or, you know, a shelter in place, but it's like, you know, you do lose electricity for three days or something, which is happening to people often Absolutely. with these storms. Um, do you have what you need? Um, flashlights? Flashlights, I think are very important. And people tend to forget that their phone probably has a flashlight too, right? right. So in a lot of ways, we have other technology that can help with that. But, you know, I keep in my in my equipment bin flashlights. I keep glow sticks. You know, this time Halloween, you can go out and get those little trick-or-treating lanyards that are little flashlights. Right after Halloween, they're half price. I don't care that they have goblins and pumpkins on them. They're going <laughs> in my they're going in my supply kit. Um, and it's thinking about, oh, I need something that's going to do the job, but it isn't necessarily what I think it might be. Right. If you're someone who relies on batteries and you think, like I have a hand crank transistor radio in my supply kit. Why? Because I might not have power. I might not, you know, the, the cell towers might be gone. I might not have access to things. You say, well, where am I going to get access to the radio besides running my car battery, which I might not want to do? Well, so that's a helpful way to think. Like you always think, well, I'll have my phone. Well, you know, you your phone not. actually not might be a tool, you might not have it on you, it might not be charged, it might not have a sync signal. We can't rely 100% on that. I think about batteries. You might be somebody who likes being a rechargeable battery kind of house. That's great, unless you can't charge your batteries, right? The, right. Whole, the whole point sometimes of having some batteries is that you have a backup storage. Yes. We have a solar charger that helps with our phones. So we we lost power for over 24 hours about five months into the pandemic mm-hmm. and i'll tell you i really worried about my my freezer and all that food that yes, I, I always labeled think about and bought that. and purchased yes yes um, but that was another way of saying all right okay what are what can we shut down what what can i move and the first thing i did was to make sure our solar chargers that will help back up our charging our phones was outside in the sun right like let's soak that up in case we need it So it's a little bit of thinking ahead and planning ahead around what's most critical to you. Mm -hmm. The other part of this critical part, which is beyond supplies that I like to talk to people about is what's information that we need to have, right? So what are our doctor's phone numbers? Mm -hmm. How do we call police in a non-emergency or fire in a non-emergency? Do we know how to turn the gas and the water supply off to our house? Do we have that list of medication in case we need it and someone asks? Um, Do we have access to our insurance information if we aren't at our house? Like, what's that collection of information we want to make sure we have? And if it's not at our fingertips, it's in the cloud somewhere or somebody else has safe information or safe keeping of it so that we can access that. So it's not just what do I need to grab and grow, go, but what needs to exist for me to keep going? Wow, this is so good. And it's interesting because when I moved out here, a lot of my friends were like, well, you need to have a grab and go back. I, we've been here six years. I still do not have, I'll be yeah. honest, I do not have that yeah. grab and go back, which is why, you know, with everything that's happened over the course of the pandemic and everything, I realized maybe now is the time to put yeah. that together. So what about our passports? having cash, yes. if if we yeah. did have this grab and go bag, yeah. uh, obviously we'll have in the car, the food and the water, um, medications, personal hygiene. Let's assume that's in one of those, you know, have to, like a bag, an actual bag. bag. And waterproof ideally and, and just kind of element proof would be great. Yes. yes. Yeah. What do we want in terms of, you know, yeah. let's, you, you can't go to an ATM machine. Yeah. You can't get cash. Right. Like, how much money do we want to have on hand? Do we need to be able to grab our passports? Yeah. What else do we need? Yeah, I think uh, your ability to grab the things that are, again, your your most important life documents, your passport, birth certificates, mm. um, your driver's license, those things. Again, I always recommend people have copies of this in a cloud account, something that's really trusted and secure so they can access it if they need it. But n- Taking care of our originals is also important. So where are those? 
do you, do you know where they are? Are they all together that you can grab them uh, quickly? And do you feel good that if you did the mental accounting of what do I need? Oh yeah, it's all in there is, is always helpful. I also think you mentioned cash. I talk about cash with a lot of people because you're absolutely right. ATMs won't work. And I also encourage smaller bills Hmm. and you know, in small might be twenties, but even smaller. So you have, you've got a tree in your front lawn and it's blocking your car and you can finally get somebody with a chainsaw who's going to come break it up. And they're like, yeah, I can't take credit cards. I can take cash. And you say, Oh great. Can you break a 50? And he's like, Nope. That's mine now, right? So right. having smaller smaller dollars is actually going to be an effective part of currency. So I always do keep a, a fair amount of cash on hand. And most importantly, I make sure that I and my husband both know where it is. That's a really important part, right? So emergency p- preparation tends to fall on one human in the house, which is great, except if the other humans need to know about it. You know, either that first human isn't home or we got to divide and conquer. We have 10 minutes what are we all doing? That's and right. so part of being prepared in emergency is making sure that everybody knows the plan. Everybody knows where the things are. Everybody knows what their role is. When we were young, we used to always talk about, and you have kids, so this might be something you already do. If we have a fire, what's the escape route out of our house? Where are we meeting? Well, you know, how are you getting out of your room? Where are we all meeting to be safe? I remember that being a big conversation when I was a little kid and we would, and by the way, let's practice it. So we know you can actually get out the window. I don't know if people do that still today, but yeah. having a plan, knowing the plan and practicing the plan is part of all sorts of emergency preparedness. Yeah. And we used to do that in school. The firefighters would come and talk exactly. to us and the policemen would come and talk to us and we'd learn. Uh, and then I think we would have those conversations at home. Yeah. I think we have had it in terms of earthquake here because that's newer. Yeah. Um, yeah. But even I will be like, wait, what am I, am I supposed to get under the table? <laughs> you know, where yeah. is the place that I'm supposed to be? I think yeah. it's important to know that. You've mentioned a few different things that like a, hand um cranked transistor radio um yeah. the, the little pot uh camping stove and stuff do you have we're going to get to the, the the third tier of all this but do you have can i direct people to a list or you know resources to make it easy like okay here's kathy's favorite things yeah. i'm sure you've acquired some of this stuff a long time ago so it may not be I, like I have, on amazon right. and- now Right. But I, a bunch of years ago, I did a 30 day emergency preparedness challenge on my blog, which has different posts. And that's everything from, you know, getting your car ready, getting your pets ready, all that kind of stuff. And so I have all that information kind of listed in there. And I can make sure that we get for your show notes, the link to all those resources. That's awesome. All that much. I think it's just easy because it can be overwhelming. People like, okay, where do I start? But if they can read it in a blog, that's fantastic. Yeah. And this conversation is just going to like, prompt people to say, Hey, where am I prepared and where am I not prepared? Okay. So we did the at home getting out of your house. Anything else for out of our getting out of our house that we need to add? In terms of getting out of the house on a temporary basis or even a permanent basis, something I always want people to think about, which isn't, this isn't the critical life stuff you need, but it's thinking about, oh my gosh, what am I going to freak out about? For most people, it's their family photos. Yeah. It's their treasured possessions. And, you know, we always hear that thing like, oh, your house are on fire and you had to grab one thing to leave your house with. What would it be? I mean, honestly, if you have an answer to that question, do you have a plan around that answer? Right. Um, If you know that your photos, every time you see it on the news and tornadoes have devastated a town, Mm. they always focus on the mother who's sitting and she's holding the destroyed photo album. They're talking about the photos and memories they've lost. And I always want people to kind of have that in mind that we are, we talk about emergency preparedness in terms of life saving, life preserving, whether that's we need to eat for three weeks and we don't know if we're going to get food or we have to leave our house. But there's more that we care about yes. that if that's part of your mental yeah. um, inventory, yes. making sure that's part of your emergency prepared plans, I think is important. Right. Like that special, you know, a necklace your grandmother gave you or something yeah. like that, that right. you want to make sure that yeah. you would be devastated if it was, if yeah. it was burnt up in a fire or something. Right. Um, okay. That's important. Okay. Now we have to be out longer, maybe permanently. What's that's, what does that look like? That seems yeah. intense. 
It is intense, right? So some of it is going to be that basic life, but you know, there's a chance your house burns down or you're fleeing. You yeah. you may be in a relocation situation, right? So yes. you may be going to a hotel, you may be staying with family. So maybe food and hygiene and, you know, your medications, yes, but food and hygiene and water, maybe that's not as critical. Now we're getting back to making sure we've got what are those, what's the critical paperwork we're going to need access to? Yep. It's those insurance documents. Um, it's understanding all of our financial information and do we have access to different things? Um, it's grabbing that cash that you've been holding on to saying, all right, that's got to go with me. Yes. Um, but those, those ideas of saying, if I needed to start over somewhere else, mm. School, your children's school records, your children's medical records, if you need to register them in a new school, those important documents like marriage certificate, um, your veteran discharge paperwork, uh, estate trust, those things, these things that we really have in our home and we feel good because we checked the box and got them done or we know where they are. But if they end up perishing and we have to start over somewhere else, we're really set back. So when I think about leaving for good, some of this is really around how are we starting over somewhere else? Mm. That's really kind of the action that comes out of fleeing for good. Wow. And what, and that would be because a house burned down, tornado came through, ripped up your house. I mean, just. Yeah. Some, right? some devastation to your some home devastation that you just plate, can't, whatever you can't go back to and your house is, you know, your house will be gone, condemned, something. Um, yes, obviously if it's a fire, you know, you it's not like you said, if there's a hurricane coming and they know, and you've been, they're tracking it yeah. and you've got three days, but right. if you have to grab and go again, you really need to make sure that there's been a family discussion about this. Everybody knows what needs to be done. And I like what you said, where if you did have just five minutes or something, you know, your husband grabs the, yeah whatever the food supplies and the water or whatever, and you're maybe grabbing the paperwork and the kids are grabbing something else. Yeah. And it's having those conversations when we're not in a time of crisis. Yes. And yes. when you can have popcorn and sit around and take notes and, and it's okay. And everybody's safe. And you say, yes. what would we do? Right. Who's grabbing the puppy? Yes. Who's doing, who's doing this? What else would you need? If we had to go away for a week, what would you be devastated to not have? And do we have room for that in a car? Um, okay. So it's doing some of that just blank slate planning as a family so that you can build a plan around that. But also you can build comfort. You can build language around safety. Yes. You can build language around resilience. Yes. And you can rely on that when, gosh forbid, a crisis comes. Absolutely. So Kathy, we've got all three of these plans. You've got a resource from your blog that we're going to be able to look at. Um, obviously, there's going to be an emotional component if you have to flee your home and know that you can't yes. go back and you'll have to figure that stuff out. But what's really critical is to make sure that the damage done is minimized to the degree that you said, like there's the heirloom you know, jewelry, there's the photographs you know, the, the important treasured pieces in your home. And then obviously being able to go, oh my goodness, I did, I do have my passport. I do have the birth certificates. You're not creating extra level of stress right. for yourself, trying to piece your life back together. Exactly. And I think that idea of preparedness is also things like, I know a storm's coming. I should probably clear the, clear our lawn of any debris or put mm -hmm. the patio furniture away, right? So how do we, what are some things that we can do to reduce potential damage yes. in advance? That can be part of a plan too. Again, it's not the moment's notice plan, but a lot of what we face is not a moment's notice crisis. Um, when we do, when you do have an earthquake, like what are some things that you can always say, you know, we don't need to have all the breakable stuff out on open shelving. Like maybe that isn't a great plan if you live in an earthquake prone area. I'm right. um, thinking about different things to say, how do we in general reduce risk? Yes. And reduce the impact and damage that an emergency might prepare. That's right. You're mitigating risk. And I remember one time when yeah. we moved out here, the umbrella, you know, the, that sits on the patio table 
like flew off into the yard, you know? And when we moved into this house, one time it was in the pool. It just whoop up and down, but it had it been closed and put some, you know, maybe in the garage, it it would have just been one less thing to deal with. But thankfully it didn't go through a window or gone further than that. Right. So there are things that we could be doing. It could have been, it could have done more damage. It could have hurt someone. It yes. could have taken your car out. could have done a lot of different things. And you learn, you learn the hard way, right? And fortunately that wasn't so bad a situation, but you say next time like, oh. Right. Yeah. We gotta, yeah, who, yeah. Who's on, who's on umbrella duty? That's right. Usually yeah. my husband, of course. <laughs> say that, but that is, yeah. that is his, that's his area. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else around this. Cause I found your, your stories, that you were doing to help prepare people really interesting. And I, you know, as I was watching you, I thought, gosh, we take so much for granted. And I think if the pandemic did one thing, it kind of shook us all up a little bit to not do that. I mean, there's the cargo ships with all sorts of supplies right now sitting there waiting to uh, make their way. And we're so fortunate, especially in the United States of having access pretty much 24 seven to everything, right? I mean, there's even drug stores that do literally stay open all yeah. night long. And so we just assume we'll just be able to run out and get what we need. And that's, we, we, we've learned now that that isn't the case, but then we can settle back into the comfort and just want it to be that way. Right. Yes. And I think that that's absolutely right. I think that's this idea that having gone through the pandemic helps us all think a little bit about how vulnerable we felt, felt, absolutely. And what do we want to do to, reduce that sense of vulnerability in the, f- in the future. But really, I think a lot of people learn a lot more about our supply chain, uh, how dependent we are on service labor, so many different things that we didn't really necessarily appreciate about our society, our it's ecosystem, true. our economic ecosystem kind of showed itself it's like, oh, oh, that's a that's a point I need to be prepared for in the future because I don't know that I can count on that in the future. Um, and at the same time, I think so many things improved, right? We A lot of services were born and activities were born out of saying, oh, can't rely on the grid, can't rely on what we used to have. Let's do something new. So I do think it was a little bit of a mother of, inv- of um, innovation in that sense. Yes. But where we want, and you mentioned before, that emotional part, when it comes to, oh my gosh, something's about to happen. I'm at risk. My family's at risk. My dog's at risk. My home's at risk. There's a lot that happens instantly. And knowing that you can say, no, I've taken some steps so that I don't have to worry as much as I might. So what can I focus on now that Mm -hmm. I know I've already made backups to all my important documents and they're in a cloud account and I have the access to it. And I know somebody who doesn't live near me has access to it. All right. Building redundancy thinking about what's going to help you sleep at night, doing that work when we're not facing a crisis goes a long way to help us really rise to the occasion in the moment where it happens. Totally. One thing that you you won't probably have an answer to, but I have to ask because I'm curious, yeah. what if all cell service goes out and you've got family across the country or in another country, you want to get connected to the people you love? I mean, I think about after 9-11, you know, everyone frantically trying to call everyone they love to just check in. That was right. The first thing we all were doing was trying to reach people and we couldn't. What if it was just out? How could you make a plan with your family that said, if this scenario happens, we'll meet here? You know what I mean? Um, Yes. Especially if you can't communicate with them by phone or text. And so I think that's, that's, it's a real possibility, right? We could be without cell service or something. Um, so I don't have internet. A great, yeah. Right. I don't have a great answer for you of how do you get in touch, but one of the things that I think is a great plan is it, in the in the New York that was a great example, right? Lots of people on the East Coast didn't, you know, Northeast didn't have access to things. But as they got access, do you have a designated person who lives nowhere near you who in your family is the contact person, right? So I have an uncle who lives in Pittsburgh and we can say Guys, if everything, you know, if something happens and we need to get in touch with each other, everybody call that uncle Mm. and he'll know where everybody is and he'll keep track, right? So having a little bit of a geographic um, disparate plan (laughs) to say, oh, they're probably in a safer spot. How do we, how do we manage for communication that way? So it isn't so much, we all need to talk to each other. 
we may only need one touch point. But absolutely, the idea that we might not have cell service is going to shut down communication for a lot of people. Hmm. Is it permanent or is it temporary? Who knows? Do you have a landline? It's scary. Yeah. Do you have a landline? Yeah, I do. I do not have a landline. I'm surprised. And I would think you would have. Yeah. Yeah. I, we, we didn't get it when we moved. It wasn't already existing in our house. So the the previous owners had taken it out and, um, and we didn't do anything to reinstall it or Do you think it's worth having one? I, you know, I think there's some value, but you also then have to remember you need to have a landline telephone, um, around. Yeah. Right. A phone that actually works with that. Yeah. And who are you calling? I don't you're know. Calling somebody who has a landline? Maybe nine one one. You're <laughs> calling. Maybe, Maybe you're calling. Or calling. That's what I'm thinking yeah. of. If there's an emergency yeah. and your cell's out, but the landlines would work, yeah. and they're traceable back to your home. Yeah, that's the one yeah. reason I think no, of a landline. I, I, we don't I, have I one either. Of, we used to. We used to, but not when we moved yeah. here either. Yeah. I think a lot of people they hold on to a landline just for emergency purposes, and I I get it. It's not a it's not a choice that we had made. Right. Um, and. You know, my husband and I, we used to, um, when he was working downtown and not two rooms away from me, we used to have this idea of saying, okay, if something goes wrong and you're at work right, and I'm home, yes, where will we meet? Exactly. Are you, are you making your way home? Are you trying to get on the T and happen on the orange line and coming north to me? Am I going to go meet you somewhere? When we were both working in the city, something goes on. Where are we meeting together? So it's even thinking about, oh, the kids are at school. What happens if... Something happens during the day. What's our connection on that? These ideas of the what if scenarios that aren't, you know, it, we're not talking about what happens if the aliens come, right? We're talking about something that yet. might, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we have we have much fewer options if the aliens come. <laughs> um, my, my duffel bags downstairs aren't going to help me. But the idea of, all right, what are the scenarios you're going to work with that we're saying, oh my gosh. This is a communication gap where the kids need to know where we're going to find them or if we're going to come. Or my husband needs to know, am I expecting him to come home or not? Or should I go meet him? Again, these are those those what if scenarios that talking about it when it's not a crisis can help flesh out some of the missing things that I don't think of from my perspective because I'm not living their life. That's right. I think this has been fantastic. And I do hope it sparks conversation. I mean, it's something that I've been thinking about that we need to be doing in my family and um, am aware. I think I'm pretty good for a shelter in place situation, but the rest of it, maybe not so much. Do you keep anything just like a, any go bag stuff in your trunk of your car, like camping gear, anything like that, just to make part of it easier? Yeah, we both, my husband and I in our cars have a small kit that's a combination of, you know, there's protein bars and I change them out every few months. Uh, There's a water bottle for each of us. There's a a solar blanket. And then, of course, basic car care if we're stuck on the side of the road. First aid, so it's probably right. right? Exactly. Basic first aid stuff, you know, small, small container the size of two decks of cards. So basic stuff because if we're, that's going to come up like, oh, we got stranded in a snowstorm or, oh, we were, we had car trouble and we're away from immediate help. So we want some basics there too, but emergencies happen when you're in cars for sure. That's true too. Thinking about that is there. Or also also easier to to get out just to get out if half of it's not half, but important things are in your car. That's just a few less things you have to grab. Exactly. And I think, you know, one of the things that I also keep in mind and I tell people, I've got this great supply kit in my basement, but I go through it at least once a year. Has any of the first aid or medication that I put in there expired? Mm. Is the food no longer good? Um, I swap out the water bottles, you know, we'll end up using it. If I've got pantry food and things that I keep it, we we eat from there to make sure yes. that we're keeping rotation because keeping something medication in a, in a first aid kit for six years, and then you finally need it and it's not good anymore, doesn't help you. No. <laughs> so part of this, like any organization system, is maintenance. So for me, September 1st every year is my time that I go in. It's to, around Labor Day. I go in and review everything. I take everything out. I take an inventory of it. What am I missing? What do I want to replace? What in our life has changed, right? Like we, my husband used to wear contacts all the time, so I would keep contact lens solution. Mm. He hasn't worn contacts in two years. Why am I keeping contact lens solution in there? Um, you know, or thinking about how your needs as a family change 
that that equipment might that um, those supplies might change as well. And and doing that mental inventory of needs is really part of what I think helps me feel prepared. Yeah. And you just mentioned something important, maybe, you know, making sure you have your glasses ready to go. If yeah. you, I mean, that would be really bad two in the morning yes. with me without yeah. contacts or glasses. I mean, that yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, no. And that's, that's part of that critical review, right? You think about what do you need on a daily basis? You need, if you need glasses to drive, you need glasses to see, you need glasses to read. Yeah. Make that's, sure you have your glasses ready to go. Even, even if it's, even if it's, oh, I have a backup pair. That's a slightly older prescription or it's frames. I don't like anymore. Totally. Instead of saying, I'm going to donate these say that's going to go in my go bag. That's right. That's right. And then, cause you don't use them every day, but they're there if you need them in a case yeah. of an emergency. Um, yeah. I find this really helpful and interesting. And I, I am hoping and certain that many people listening are also going to, it's going to get them thinking and having conversations yeah. with their family. Let's get your URL, your website listed, yeah. and I'll link the blog post that Kathy referenced today. Where, where do I direct them, Kathy? So we're going to go to clevergirlorganizing.com, which is where all things Clever Girl lives. Yes. And if somebody wants to go check out those stories that you mentioned on Instagram, I have them st- saved in a highlight, at, and that's Kathy Vines Says on Instagram. So that's a real easy way to click on that. Just go look for emergency as one of my highlights on Instagram. Oh, that's great. It's in the highlights. Repeat your, yeah. your handle again for Instagram. Kathy Vines Says, and that's Kathy with a K. That's perfect. Um, So good to be with you again today, Kathy. I appreciate your time today. And I will link the other two interviews we did too, because they're on home organization and they're also really helpful and important to listen to. I'm so glad. I I love being able to talk about this topic with you. Yeah, I I think you're passionate about it. Yeah, I am. And I don't even know how I got passionate about it, but I just know I, it's, it's something I could talk about with people for a long time. So I'm grateful to have had a little time with you. Good. I, I, I could keep you, you know, we could go so deep into this stuff, but this is a great, this is a great um, foundation for people and Good. it's going to help set them up. God forbid there is another scenario, you know, like a lockdown or that they need to leave their home. So thank you for your time today, Kathy. Always, a, always a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I hope you gained some new information or inspiration for your life. That is that the essence of this show is to really wake up to what's possible for you to reclaim your beautiful voice and to really learn to love and prioritize yourself. So if you gained any value from any of the conversations you've tuned into, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast player. You can do that right now on your phone. And please do consider leaving a rating and review if you have yet to do so on Apple Podcasts. It's actually how more women can find the show. And I really want to grow a community of women who are loving themselves and living full on. So thank you as always for tuning in. And I look forward to reconnecting with you next Wednesday. Bye for now.